Well, good morning again. Let us pray before we start. Father, as we come to you again, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be here, that the words are spoken are your words, your thoughts, your ideas, and your counsel. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of a man who was driving in rural South Central Iowa, and he was on a rural road, and it was gravel, not paved. And he was really frustrated because he didn't have a clue where he was at. He was completely lost. He had no GPS. And the map that he had didn't show the road he was on. And so he's driving along, and he noticed, off to the left, a young boy sitting beside the road. And so he stopped, he rolled down the window, and he said, Little boy, he said, can you tell me where Highway 23 is? And the boy said, no. Well, can you tell me where the nearest town is? Mm, no. Well, do you know where this road leads? No. Well, can you give me the name of this road or a number that might be assigned to it? He said, no. The man was getting somewhat frustrated. He said, little boy, do you know anything? He said, well, I know I'm not lost. <laughs> I know I'm not lost. You know, from a spiritual perspective, in the communication that we have with our associates, can we make the same statement? I know that I'm not lost. I'd like to share with you a statement by Robert Coleman, and let's see if this will work. Which direction? Oh, how's that? All right, okay. Robert Coleman is a famous pastor, great orator, wrote many books, but he's probably most noted for showing people how to lead them to Christ. And I want to share this statement with you when we understand the idea, what that little boy was expressing to us, at least I'm not lost. Here's what it says. Follow along with me. How critical the church needs the kingdom vision, a vision born of the word of God and the reality of his will for humankind. Too easily we have settled for less, letting the world set our agenda while the priorities of heaven are ignored. All the while, the aimless multitudes drift ever nearer to destruction without a song to sing or a cause to espouse. The issue turns our way of God and his gospel to the world. If we are assured that the king of glory, having taken our sins away and shattered death and conquest of the grave, will save unto the uttermost all that come to him, then we cannot sit idly by while men and women perish without hope. Now, I'm going to rephrase that and kind of turn it around a little bit, give you an idea of what I think he's trying to tell us. If you do not have the assurance that your sins are forgiven, if you do not know where you stand spiritually, if you cannot say, I know that I'm not lost, you cannot witness for Christ. In fact, you cannot even live the Christian life. Assurance is absolutely essential. This morning, we're going to talk about the Christian voyage, and we're going to use an analogy of a cruise ship. And uh, in order to successfully reach our destination, these six steps we need to follow. Number one is our destination. It's important that we know where we're going. Number two, our purpose for the trip. Number three, it's cost. Number four, it's activity which makes you eligible once you board the ship gospel. And number five is the many benefits that it provides. And number six, is that we will reach our final destination safe and secure. 
So let's kind of walk through that now and apply a walk and our journey by looking at our destination. What is our destination? Our destination is a new heaven and the new earth. It's a place where there is no tears. It's a place where there's no violence. It's a place where there's no death. It's a place where you and I will meet Jesus and the Father face to face. Is that not unbelievable? I cannot even imagine that. But also it's a place where there is no death. Number two is our purpose for the voyage. And I'll have to tell you a story about that. There was a man and his wife uh, who was sitting up on a, a Sunday morning, and they said, you know what, let's take a spring vacation. And uh, they said, all right, all right, let's, let's, let's think about it. So they had that discussion. They went on hour after hour and came up with no answers. Well, we'll come back to it. So about four or five days later, the husband's at work, and he's eating a sandwich in the lunchroom. And he says, wait a minute, I've got it. I've got it, it just came to me. We're going on a cruise. I know my wife will love it. Hmm, and I think where we'll go is the Northern Caribbean. Oh, yeah, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, St. John, St. Martin, St. Bartholomew. That's where we're going. She'll love it. I can't wait to tell her. So he ran down to the travel agency, and he paid the funds. So he gets home that night, he opens the door, his wife's out in the backyard, he says, Dale, come on in, come on in, come on, I got something to tell you, you are going to be thrilled. And so she comes in and says, what's all the excitement? He said, dear, we're going on a cruise. She said, a cruise? He said, well, I understand that it's pretty romantic. And she said, well, why are we going? Some humor there, but you know what? It is a tragedy because the purpose of our voyage is intimacy. And we're comparing that, the idea of romance, with intimacy. Our purpose is to know Jesus Christ in a very personal, intimate way. To live the Christian life, to take the voyage, is to know God. Jesus, when, just before he went to Gethsemane, he was praying to his father. And he said, this is the eternal life, that they may know the only true God and the one who he has sent. In Acts chapter 2, verses 47, or excuse me, 28 and 29, The disciples of Jesus were on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee the day before they had fed the 5,000. They left that night because they were beat, they were tired, they wanted to get away from people for a minute or two. I've been in that boat. But the crowd came around the lake, and they surrounded Jesus, and they asked him this question. What work must we do that we can do the works of God? You understand the question? What work can we do that we can do the works of God? So what they're saying is, I know there's a work to do, but how can we do it? And Jesus said, the work that you must do is to believe in the one whom he has sent. The ten virgins, all were Christians. But one reason or the other, five had no oil and five did. When the bridegroom came, he took the five, because the other five took off trying to find some oil. They go to his home, and the other five come back, and they knock on the door, and they said, let us in. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, I don't know you. So our purpose, our purpose for our voyage is to know Jesus. That should be our goal. That is our objective. Number three. The cost. You say, oh, hold it right there. We better stop the sermon now because it doesn't cost anything to get on the ship, Grace. I beg to differ with you. Oh, there's no monetary exchange of funds. There isn't enough works that we can do that will buy the ticket. 
And yet Jesus made an interesting statement. Some people are somewhat baffled by that. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Now, the interesting thing about this comment, he says there's a cost, but the cost is consistent all the way through the process. You see that? The cost is consistent all the way through the process. Well, what is the cost? What is the price? There we go. Let's go to some text you're pretty familiar with, John 1, 12 and 13, and Ephesians 2, 18 and 19. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, that means we accept Jesus for who he is, for what he is. He is our Savior. He is our Lord of our life. He is the Messiah. That's what he claims to be. That's all he asked the Jewish leaders. He said, look, if you can't believe what I say, just do and watch what I do. Didn't he say the thing about John the Baptist? Remember John the Baptist thinking, you know, I don't know, is this the right guy or not? So he sent his disciples out, and Jesus told them, just tell him what you see. That was good enough. The gospel is simple. The Bible has some complexities, there's no doubt about it. But it's also simple that even a child can understand the gospel. And so we'll go on here. Children born, not of natural descent, not of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And then he goes on to say, which we read before, for through him we both have access, we'll come back to that, to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens, God's people, and also members of the whole of uh, members of the household. That is amazing. By accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, acknowledging your sin, knowing you have no chance, realizing what God had to do in order to save you. Why were we yet sinners? Why we have ignored him, Christ died for us. To be children of God. You know, some people think we're all children of God. Not true. Only those that accept Jesus are children of God. And God makes it easy for us. Jesus made it so easy. We say, how is it possible, as we discussed in Sabbath school, that many, and maybe most, as we understand the scriptures, will not accept that? So what is the cost? We cannot pay for what happened back in Avon Eve's day when it says because of the sin of one man, sin spread to all men. Did you have a choice, by the way? How many think we had a choice in accepting sin? You had none. You were born a sinner. You were born in rebellion to God. But then Jesus has another plan. Because of the righteousness of one man, righteousness spread to all men. But there's a slight difference between the two. One, there is no choice, and in the other, there is. So Jesus basically says to us, receive me, accept me for who I am. I'll forgive you sin. I've already paid for your sin. When Jesus died on the cross, when he lived the perfect life, he died on the cross. He was resurrected, and he had his coronation in Revelation chapter 5. He paid for the sin of the past. He paid for the sin of today. And he paid for the sin in the future. All sin is paid for. The question, does it apply to me? If you accept him, if you accept his offer and his gifts, There we go. The Bible says this righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all. There we go again. Believe. You ever talk to people who say, I hate that word, believe. Oh, it's much more than that. Well, it is true. When you believe in someone, it means that you have an indication of trust. 
You believe in someone, what they said is true. And by the way, Rome wasn't built in a city, and neither is faith in Christ. It is a term that we use called sanctification. It's learning to lean, learning to trust. We'll come to that later. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, male or female, what your economic situation is. It makes no difference. We are all justified freely by his grace to the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have, been uh, we have been saved by faith, we are justified, the Bible says. That means declared righteous. Now, we always talk, well, how do I have to? I need to be prepared for Jesus. I want to tell you right now. If you accept his promise, your record is clean. When God looks at you, he sees a perfect record because Jesus made an exchange. He took our filthy rags of righteousness. He gave us his robe of righteousness. I want you to think about that. That's the only way we can be saved. And yet people have trouble grasping that. Many will not accept that. Got a lot of slides, so. Whoops. There we go. One more. What are the benefits of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I'm going to go back one. There we go. There are benefits. Remember, that's one of the six steps. What are the benefits? Eternal life is one of the benefits. But righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe there is no difference. We are saved freely by his grace, as we read before. You receive eternal life. And you, don't, you know what's interesting about this? If it was you and I making a decision, how are we going to work the plan of salvation? We'd probably do this. Well, wait a minute here. Uh, we can't give him eternal life yet. Let's give him about 90 days. He did that on my first job. I was on probation for 90 days. Well, well, we'll give you 60. How's that? And if you kind of toe the line, we might throw eternal life in. Jesus said, just as you are, a sinner still in your habits and everything else, he said, you know what? You're a child of God now. You're a citizen of heaven. You're part of the household. And along with that comes eternal life. Amazing. It's amazing. Number two, he gives us another gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is when, remember, on Pentecost, and Peter went through all the sins of the people, and then ultimately they nailed the one they're supposed to worship to the cross. And so Peter said, after they said, what do we do? How can we change this? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why he gives us the Holy Spirit. Number three, the gift of repentance. We even need God's help and input in order to repent. You know, I've heard people, and especially new believers, well, I'm working hard on repenting. Uh, why don't you just ask God for it? It's a lot easier and a lot less frustrating. And he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to do two things, grant rep repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sin. They fall together. Did, God, did Jesus do a lot of work for us, huh? You think he wants to save us? We already read this out of John 1, 19. We're children of God, citizens of heaven. Ah, oh, no, here's, here's the big one. Access to the throne of God. When you look at the old covenant, when the high priest went into the most holy place, they tied a, ro a rope around his waist so in case he wasn't pure and hurt, they could pull him out and nobody's certainly going to go in and get him. And that's the only access there was. The people had to stand outside and pray on the Day of Atonement. 
And we know that even though they confessed their sins, their sins weren't paid for. And so their sins, it's kind of like a deal on consignment. The sins stayed in the sanctuary because they were not paid for. And so Paul tells us of John, yes, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if there is no resurrection, because there was a discussion in the church about the resurrection, if there is no resurrection, then all who have fallen asleep in Jesus are lost. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he purchased those sins that were in the sanctuary. So the sanctuary is now clean. And so let's go on with this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have, what's the word? Confidence. Assurance. There it is again. To enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way. This is a new covenant. Open for us through the curtain. A curtain of cloth? It's a curtain of his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. And what do we got here? The full what? What is it? Assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Isn't it nice to get rid of a guilty conscience? By the way, I should tell you, if you're not studying God's word, you can't trust your conscience. Your conscience has to be trained. Sometimes your conscience will tell you something that's not correct. Oh, oh, you shouldn't do this, but not according to the Bible. Your conscience has to be trained. And number six, I come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly, Jesus said. That isn't when we reach the new heaven and new earth. That isn't at the second coming. That's now. It doesn't mean we don't go through difficulties. It doesn't mean we don't go through struggles. We do. But therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. I read a biography on Howard Hughes. And I read the last few years of his life. And I will tell you right now, he had no peace. Money doesn't buy it. A good job doesn't buy it. Well, a good wife would be close. But in essence... Only Jesus can provide that for us. And so, okay, you say, all right, I got it. We are saved, we have eternal life. Now what? Let's look at, let's see if I turned the right one here. No, I didn't. Let's try it again. Oh, I don't want to miss John 15. I'll have to watch our time here. What does it mean for us to be attached? What does it mean for us to receive him? This is one of the best texts in the Bible to help us get it straight. I am the true vine, Jesus said, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Now, let's stop there. I believe, as most Adventists do, there's no such thing as once saved or saved. And the reason there isn't is because Jesus always want us, wants us to make a choice for him. If the day comes and we're not going to make that choice anymore and that happens, he wants to honor that. And it's interesting that the only way that you'll be cut away from the vine is that you bear no fruit. Now, I want you to think about that. It's because we bear no fruit that the branch is cut off. Now, let's hold that. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so you'll be more fruitful. That's part of growth, part of sanctification. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You say, oh, no, no, I can't be. They're fighting over who's going to be the CEO, the CFO, the COO, the director of the board. The disciples were constantly at one of the throats about who was going to have the most powerful position. I can't be. And Jesus said, you know what? You're already clean. What does that tell us? One thing the disciples did do, even though they had issues, 
is they kept walking with Jesus. And you remember the time when Jesus said, and he lost many disciples over this, not the twelve. He said, you need to drink my blood and eat my flesh. He was talking about intimate relationship. And many left him, the Bible says. And then he turned to the disciples. Are you going to leave me too? And Peter, like usual, stepped up and said, no, we're not leaving you. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And Jesus told him, you didn't do that on your own, but you got that from my Father. Jesus never leaves us. We leave him. And because the disciples stayed with him, even though they had problems with certain sins, he stayed with them. And you know, they believed this idea, and they had a, prof a prophetic mistake. The church made a mistake in prophecy. They said, well, you know what? Uh, he's not going to die. In fact, back in the second century, basically is when we learn that the Jewish leaders stopped reading Isaiah 53 because they didn't buy the concept of the Messiah dying. What they did buy was the Messiah will get rid of those nasty Romans. And the Jews believed that. They taught that, and that became the culture of the church Culture can be a bad thing. Not every time, but it can be. And you know, those disciples, up until Jesus came back after he was resurrected and met them in the upper room, they still believe that. You think they were in the upper room because I know Jesus was coming because he was resurrected? No, the Bible says they were up there because they were afraid of who? The Jews. So Jesus says, remain in me, and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. If we don't produce fruit, the branch is going to be cut. But this just says, Jesus produces the fruit. Well, that's kind of confusing. So let's go on. It must remain in the vine. Jesus is saying, I'll take care of the fruit. What I want you to do is stay attached to the vine. And that's what the disciples were doing. Don't worry about fruit, because you can't do anything about it, but I can. What I want you to do is something that you can do, and that is this, to stay attached. Keep walking with me. I'll get you through this. I'll put up with your difficulties. And ultimately, as you get to know me better, as you get to love me more, you will change. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, he didn't say you only give up a couple of apples. He said the whole tree is going to be full. And he's going to do it. I want to take you back about you're already clean. We celebrated the communion service just how many weeks ago? Three? Four? I can't remember. Okay pay you later. That's probably correct. Okay, and I want to talk to you about foot washing for just a second. You know, foot washing was pretty much an event, an event in every evangelical church a hundred years ago. You say, why did they stop it? Well, many stopped it because they said, we don't wear sandals and our feet aren't dusty anymore, so why do it? So, yes, the Foot washing service is about humility. The disciples didn't get up and wash anybody's feet. It was usually the duty of the host. Well, there was no host there. And you think they're going to do it when they're going, to be getting, they're going to be the next CEO? No, that somebody else has to do that. And so nobody washed anybody's feet. And so Jesus gets up, and you know the story. He begins to wash their feet, and he comes to Peter. Don't ever forget this. This is the most significant thing about foot washing. And Peter was thoroughly embarrassed and probably hang, hung his head in shame. And he said, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. And Peter says, give me a bath. I'll take the shower right now. What Peter was talking about, what Jesus was talking about, 
We don't need to be rebaptized. The foot washing is a constant reminder that Jesus washes us every day. So when you say, well, I haven't really attended much on foot washing, I want to tell you something. We need to talk more about the fact this is reminding us that Jesus is cleansing us every day. Can you say amen to that? That's what foot washing is all about. Okay. Now we're to the point, what do we do? We stay attached and so forth. We move along here. For the grace of God is a pure that offers salvation to all people. We just covered that. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Did you see the key there? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the pleasant hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us all, from wickedness and to purify itself of people that are very eager to do what is good. That doesn't happen overnight. I know when I was first baptized, I told Carol, I said, well, it takes care of the sin. I don't have any habits now. That lasted about 15 minutes. I found out I still had the same problems. What I didn't realize is that when you except Christ as your personal Savior, you still keep your carnal nature. It's still there. And that's why God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to counteract its effect. Now, the carnal nature has been put aside, but it's still there. And Jesus now is the king of our soul. But do you think the carnal nature is going to sit around and say, okay, fine, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. No, it doesn't. As Paul says, we fight against principalities and powers in high places. The understanding of sin and judgment is critical for us to have the relationship that we can have with Christ. Charles Spurgeon, British citizen, pastor, great orator, writer, and some people call the prince of all pastors. He uh, began preaching at 19 years of age. He died at the age of 56, which is probably about the mortality rate of that, uh, that uh, time. And Charles Spurgeon would draw every Sunday at least 6,000 people. The church could hold no more. And what they say is, I don't know if this is true or not, it's just kind of a rumor. He got up one Sunday and he said, you know what, to the members, uh, why don't you guys go home and read the book of Mark? Because we got thousands out there who have never heard the message. Every week, 25,000 sermons went out to newspapers and periodicals, not only in this country, but throughout the world. But folks, we've talked about the high points of our faith. There are sometimes low points. There are some times we will doubt. I've been there, and I think you have too. There are times when it could be the events of life, it could be a death in the family, it could be a number of things, and we just kind of drop our head and say, I don't know. Charles Spurgeon, in the time of his life where he was most popular and influential, mentioned this in his autobiography. He says, I felt at the time very weary and very sad and very heavy at heart. I began to doubt, doubt my own mind whether I really enjoyed the things that I preached to others. If you feel that way today, look, you're not the only one. Some of the greatest lights have had the same feelings. But like Charles Spurgeon, through prayer, and we'll talk about it to close up here in a minute, he got over that. And he kept walking with Jesus. Charles Spurgeon, of what I have read, is one of the most Christ-centered pastors I have ever heard. But, you know, the Apostle Paul had the same problem as Charles Spurgeon. He had times 
And Romans 7, 21 through 25 has been one of the more controversial texts in the Bible over time. Because some people say, oh, this couldn't be after he was converted. This has got to be before conversion. Some people just never get the idea that growing in faith takes time. And we're going to have times when we are down so low. The valley is so below us that ultimately we'll get back on the mountaintop. So I find this law at work, Paul says. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. What he's saying is the kind of nature is still here. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Let me ask you something. Does a non-Christian have an inner being a love for God's law? No, they don't. And so we see here that Paul was a Christian. This was present tense. But then he says, I see another law at work in me, waging against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched mind I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. So then I myself in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. That's why, folks, each day we need to make our decision for Jesus. We're going to need his help to get through life because the law of sin and death is still around and it will take advantage of us. There's nothing more than what Satan likes to do. Is he's like a roaring lion running around seeking how he can devour. He wants to take away your peace. If he can do that, he wants you to doubt. If he can do that, it's the first step toward apostasy. Now, this is an interesting statement. This is from W.W. W. Prescott. How many are familiar with W.W. W. Prescott? Ooh, we will be having a lesson on church history next week. This is what, uh, let's read about who he is. This was taken from his book, Victory in Christ. I took it out of Wallace Benden's book, Never Without an Incessor. Prescott was a field secretary of the General Conference from 1915 until his retirement in 1937. He served during that time as principal of the Australasian Missionary College. Hopefully I pronounced that right. And as head of the Bible department at Union College from 1924 to 1928. He spent the year 1930 visiting the churches and institutions of Europe. And on his return, he wrote the Spade and the Bible. And then became head of the Bible department of Emmanuel Missionary College, a post held until 1934. I want you to read his comments. For a long time, I tried to gain the victory over sin. But I failed. I have since learned the reason Instead of doing the part which God expects me to do and which I can do, I was trying to do God's part which he does not expect me to and which I cannot do. Primarily, my part is not to win the victory, but to receive the victory which has already been won for me in Christ Jesus. When Jesus said it's finished, it's finished. Praise God, huh? It's done. The victory is won. And Satan lost. It's that simple. So we just talked about John, the 15th chapter. What is he saying here? He's saying, I stopped working on fruit. I'm working on staying with Christ. That works. Jesus can make fruit. He can get it done. But I can keep the relationship by staying with him. And that's the end result. All right, well, let's move along here a little bit. Very quickly, remember the six steps. One of those steps is basically activity. Be, be, when you cross into the ship grace or gospel, you now are eligible to participate in the activities. All right, very quickly. This is a checklist for you and I. So that we can say, am I walking with Christ or am I not? There are four core values in the Bible that tell us just that. The first one, 
personal and corporate prayer. We're told that prayer is a lifeline from you and I to God. Without prayer, we cannot grow. Without prayer, there is no power. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, always be joyful. That doesn't mean we're laughing our way through life. Sometimes it sounds pretty attractive. What it means is we have peace of heart. Never stop praying. Some translations say pray without ceasing. What that means is I don't know care where you're at. I don't care what position you're in. That you're always in a position that you can talk to him. Does that make sense? Always in a position. And then I mean, whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants you to do. Now I want you to slip over real quick to Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Why does he want you to pray in secret? Because you and I may have some things we don't want to share with anybody else, even those who are closest to us. But Jesus says you can lay it all on the table with me. And he knows how difficult it would be to share that with anybody else, and sometimes you shouldn't. But you can share it with him. And I'll make this statement, that if we are not a church who prays privately, corporate prayer is of almost no good. If you're not praying independently and in private, corporate prayer, which means praying together, loses its power. I used to have a pastor one time. He asked us questions about our prayer life before he let us go to a service where we were anointing people. You know what he said? We don't want anything interfering with our connection between us and God as we pray. Now, whether he was right or wrong, it's a decision you'll have to make. But I will tell you this. Personal prayer brings intimacy. Let me share this with you, and I'll have to watch my time here, but I mean, you need to hear this. Story goes of a plantation owner who lived in Virginia, and he had a huge plantation. He had three boys and two girls. His wife was deceased. And the war between the states was going on. And so from the northeast came the Union, and from the southwest was the Confederate Army. And they were battling all the way around his property. And his feeling was, I don't go with either one of them. I'm neutral here. And during that time, a Confederate officer who happened to be dating his oldest daughter. And they had dated for a little while, and finally they made the decision they wanted to get married. And so the tradition then was that you ask the father for his approval. I had one son-in-law that asked me that one time, I want to marry my daughter. Is it okay? I said, what took you so long? And he knows who he is. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> well, the man, his name was Tom, and the plantation owner was Mr. Brown. So Tom got the courage, and he walked up to the house, knocked on the door. The butler came to the door, and the butler knew Tom, because he'd been around the house quite a bit. And he said, uh, look, I, uh, I know that Mr. Brown is busy, but would you mind if I talk to him for just a minute? I have a question to ask him. He said, sure, I'll, I'll ask him. Well, he was back in a couple of minutes. He says, come on back. He's in the library. So Tom went back in the library. There was Mr. Brown sitting at his desk doing some paperwork. He cordially greeted Tom and then asked him to sit down. He had a little few words, and then he said to Tom, what's your question? And Tom somewhat nervously said, well, I would like to take your daughter's hand. And he said, I don't know why you're asking me. You've been doing that for three months. Well, I didn't mean that. What I mean is I would like to marry your daughter. Mr. Brown looked at him for a moment and he said, why? That's a tough question, isn't it? Why? 
He said, well, I love her. And Mr. Brown said, well, that's not good enough. He said, you see, Tom, you know my wife passed away about three years ago. He said, yes. And he said, when I married her, I sure liked her a lot. And then through life, we went through some tough times, and we went through some good times. And as the years went by, our relationship grew, and it grew. And it got beyond the five senses of sight and feeling and touch and smell. It was something beyond that. And one morning, I got up fairly early. My wife was still sleeping, and as I looked at her sleep again, I knew in my heart that I loved her. And a couple of years later, she died. And he said, you know what? It ripped my heart out. Part of me died with her. That's a good marriage. I tell you that story because I have experienced that myself in the last few months. I lost my wife four months ago. And you know, my kids have been so good. They did everything they could to support me. And remember, they lost their mother too. But sometimes in the evening, as I would sit there by myself, the thoughts came over of loneliness, and I missed her so badly. Part of me also died. But then I remembered, because I would play gospel music, I'd look at pictures to bring back memories. But then I remembered John 11, and you know the story of Lazarus. It's quite the story. And at the end, you remember Jesus comes, Lazarus has been dead for four years, Martha runs out and said, oh Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. Jesus didn't contest that statement, because it was true. But for God's glory, he waited four days. If you don't know the story, you need to read it. But then he said something that has helped me. He said, Martha, you'll see your brother again. And she said, yes, I know, at the resurrection of the last day. I thought I'd tell you that story because it means much to me, much more than it did a few, few months ago. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Number two, we need to have a diligent study of the Scriptures. Now, these actions are what we call spiritual laws or spiritual disciplines. There's four of them. We talked about prayer. Studying the Scriptures. You've read the text in 2 Timothy 16, 70. The Bible is our guidebook. The buck stops there. I don't care what you read other than that, whether it be commentaries, whatever it is. The Bible has the final say. And in the days in which we live and in the time of the end, it will be those who understand Scripture that will not be deceived. The Jewish church was deceived because it refused to take the counsel of the church. And so they killed the very one that they're supposed to be worshiping. You must remember that the rulers and the leaders and the Pharisees their religion was an external religion. They were living a religious life in the flesh, being guided by the carnal nature. Paul was like that, and you can read about it in Philippians chapter 2. They were serving a religion that showed how good they were. You remember the publican and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee said, I'm glad I'm not like anybody else. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithe. And the publican who was that nasty old tax collector dropped his head and he said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went away justified. And so Jesus said to the rulers, and I'm sure it was painful in his heart, he said, you know what? He said, you need to clean the inside of the cup and the outside cup will take care of itself. I think it's normal and natural for us to look at our behavior and say, okay, good behavior is, is, is a good thing. But good behavior doesn't come by concentrating on behavior. It comes on concentrating on Jesus and letting him change us from the inside out. That's hard to do. But that's the way the Lord says that it'll only work. You see the harmony in the scriptures as we go through? 
Number three, fellowship with the brethren. We have a problem in the church today. And when I say church, I'm talking universal church. Every person who's accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, whether they be Presbyterian, whether they be Church of Christ, whether they be Methodist, whether they be Catholic, or Seventh-day Adventist. Everyone who's accepted Christ as a personal Savior is part of the family. Can you say amen to that? And so Jesus said, you know what? You need to be meeting together. And he said that through Paul. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You think the day's approaching? Really? As you look around, do you think the day's approaching? Things are getting better, right? Oh, man, this is the best it's been in years, right? You know that's not right. We don't have to be a Christian to realize that our world's in trouble. And we need to be with the brethren. Now, some people say, oh, you know, like people in the church are a bunch of hypocrites. And I would say, well, then they need to be in church. They need the Lord then. The church is a hospital for sick people of which all of us have the same de disease. We need to be inoculated by the Lord Jesus, and he will do that. And so, church, Sabbath school, and folks, we must do a lot better in attending Sabbath school. That is the only place in the church. The service and the sermon is a one-way street. It's a good thing, but it comes one way. Sabbath school is meant not to be a lecture. Sabbath school is meant for you can actually have a discussion about the principles you're studying so you can attach them to reality. That's what makes the Bible work. It's as real and effective today as it was any time in history. Do you agree with that? That's something we need to take a look at. This is not the time for us to separate. If there was ever a time that we need to be worshiping together to encourage one another, it's now. And lastly, well, I better look at church attendance. I'll do this real quick. I tried to find some polls that were current about church attendance. I couldn't find anything in our church that was within the last five years. And so I got this, and this is a biograph with regard to church attendance by four different groups, Mormon, Latter-day Saints, Protestant Christian, which is where we would probably fit, Catholic, and Orthodox. The percentages are this. They ask every member of each one of those denominations, I don't remember what the total count was, how many of you actually attend church at least sometime a, one, a week, every week? Mormons had the highest percentage. 68% of Mormons 20 years ago attended church weekly. They've dropped 1% in 20 years. Protestant Christians, 48% 20 years ago, attended church regularly. Today, 44%. Catholic, 45% 20 years ago. Today, 33. And Orthodox, 35% and 29% today. What's happening in the church is when we need it the most is when we walk away when we need it. And lastly, I think, sharing our Christian experience with others. I think Vince made a reference to that in testimonies and so forth. It says, and Paul approved their killing him. That was the killing or the slaying of Stephen. And he said, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, those who had been scattered, remember, that's not the clergy, that's the lay people, preached the word wherever they went. When you believe with all your heart, and you've taken God's promises, and you're assured of where you're at, and your status with God, you're going to tell people about it. It's just that simple. And so those are the spiritual disciplines. Take those four and see where you stand. 
If you see I'm pretty weak in three or four, I'm weak there, then that's corrected. Any man that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Oh, it's better that you do not sin, but remember you have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's there to protect you, even when you fall. And you know the nice thing? I've got some good news and better news. Good news is Jesus is our defense attorney. The best news is he's also our judge. Well, judgment was given by the Father to the Son. You can't lose. Can you imagine in a civil case or a prosecution case, you talk to your attorney, he says, yeah, yeah, I'm your, I'm your defense attorney. Who's going to make the judgment call? I am. What? Really? That is good news. But then the attorney says one more thing. I have better news than that. You know you're guilty, and there's a penalty to be paid, so I'll pay it for you. Good news, better news and best news. Well, folks, that's the message. And so I want to encourage you, as I encourage myself, that we need to be strong in the spiritual disciplines. Take a look at those four. And where you're weak, you go to the throne of grace and you can tell Jesus all about it. Close that closet door, wherever it might be, and be honest with him. You don't think he's going to welcome you back with big arms? Yes, he will. And then you can say, because you have assurance because of his promises, like a little boy that was standing on the rural road in southern Iowa, I know I'm weak, I know that I'm still trying to learn to have the character of Jesus, but I'll tell you right now, I'm not lost. Let us pray. Well, Father in heaven, uh, what a beautiful message you have for us. Oh, sometimes, you know, we're not that well disciplined. Sometimes the effects of life and other things kind of clog our schedule and we don't take time when we need to, but we realize that we study the Word. We must do that. And we pray for, I know for myself, as well for everybody here, for our church, that we can stand tall and we can boast in you. And we can say how wonderful it is that I am not lost. Amen. Thank you very much.